Hi, I'm Dave Taddeo, and this is Coders Tech. It's Tuesday, August 12, 2014, and this is Episode 6. Today I'm going to talk about beam splitters. If you've gone back and looked at Episode 2, Episode 3, and Episode 5, I talked about uh, AR coatings, HR coatings, and partial reflectors. And this is to finish up that uh, little series on coating designs, and so today I will talk about beam splitters. A little bit later on, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, optimization and the different techniques of optimization you can use and kind of what that means and some uh, resources you can go to for that. Okay, so beam splitters. Beam splitters is a tough one. Uh, beam splitters can be many, many things and can be used for uh, all kinds of different things from uh, separating polarization, uh, axis of light, or you can use a beam splitter as an output coupler, allowing a certain amount of light through and reflecting a lot more light back into the uh, resonance cavity. You can use a beam splitter. Uh, you can call um, WDM, uh, kind of a beam splitter, allowing certain light through and reflecting certain light back, and so on. So beam splitters are a lot of things, and uh, they can be um, easy to do, and they can be very difficult to do. So we'll talk about that. A good reference for beam splitters and uh, to get a good starting point for designing beam splitters is the book Practical Design of Optical Thin Films by Ron Willey. And you can find that at his website. Um, just search for Ron Willey online and uh, you'll find it. Okay, But this is a really good starting point um, for both finding designs to, to start with and there's also uh, a section on optimization uh, that you can read about, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so I'm going to show you my uh, screen again, and we're going to talk about beam splitters. Okay. So I have up here the first beam splitter I want to show you is um, a polarizing beam splitter. This is your standard cube beam splitter where the uh, cube is made out of two 45 degree um, uh, prisms cemented together with the coating, the beam splitter thin film on one of the surfaces, one of the hypotenuse of the one of the prisms, a 90 degree uh, prism, a right angle prism. And what you can see here, and this is a very standard design, I'll just show you very quickly what the design is. This design is just one high, one low, times 12, so 24 um, layers. And in this case, I'm using SiO2 and TiO2. And the prisms that I'm using this on, this cube beam splitter, uh, are BK7. Okay? And the red line here, if I calculate, you can see the red line here is at 45 degrees and P polarization. And you can see that, I'll change that to black. Is in this particular example is allowing the transmission of light between 500 and 550 in P polarization. The blue line is the S polarization. I'll change that back to blue. And it's reflecting almost 100% or close to 100% of the light in the S polarization. So this is a polarizing beam splitter. Very simple, very uh, good starting place and textbook. Like I say, look at uh, Ron Willey's practical, practical design of optical thin films and you'll find um, these textbook designs in there. If you want to, you, you, you may need to drop the reflection here between 500 and 550 or whatever wavelength that you're looking for. Um, so you'll have to add a couple of layers uh, at the end here, high and low, maybe uh, three, maybe four, maybe five layers in order to suppress this ripple, this ripple suppression. Uh, you'll add ripple suppression layers uh, here. 
okay? And that will allow uh, more transmission across here while still maintaining the reflection across the wavelength range you're looking for in S polarization. Of course, if you do ripple, uh, ripple suppression for your P polarization, you'll also have weird things happening over here in your S polarization, but presumably you're not interested in that stuff. Okay. Another way to look at a beam splitter, well I've got this open, I'll go back to P, click OK, calculate, oh, redraw, and you can see a beam splitter could also be, I'm splitting the beam of light, which is a broadband uh, wavelength of light, from, let's say from 400 to 600 or beyond, and I'm splitting this wide band or this wide wavelength range beam right here. I'm reflecting some in the p-polarization and transmitting some in the p-polarization. So this could also be considered a beam splitter, okay, where I'm reflecting some of the, in this case, the visible light and transmitting some of the visible light. That's in a cube, and if I take my air and switch that to air, oh, one, two, just one second, okay, recalculate that, and you can see how that changes. And again, so this is in air on a 45 degree angle, BK7. You can do the, add the layers at the end here, do some optimization to suppress these ripples, and you have a beam splitter, okay? You can go both ways. You can split the beam in the long wavelength range or the short wavelength range, but it's a beam splitter, okay? At 45 degree angle. The next beam splitter I'm going to just kind of look at is an output coupler. And if we take a look at this one, this is at zero degrees angle of incidence. And this is 9% at 251. And you can see at 251 it's 9%. And all this is is allowing, let's say, 9% of the light coming out of this laser, for example, as it's an output coupler, to exit the resonance cavity. And the other 91% will be reflected back in towards the high reflector at the other end of the resonance cavity. This is also a beam splitter. It's called an output coupler, but of course it's also a beam splitter. It splits the beam 91 and 9. Okay, again, the design, fairly simple. You can see that it's one high, one low, 23 times. So this is, this, in this particular case, it's 46 layers. And the materials I'm using for this are SiO2 and aluminum oxide, and the substrate is magnesium fluoride. Okay, that's a beam splitter, and we also looked at polarizing beam splitters. The next beam splitter I want to look at is a non-polarizing beam splitter. And these ones are tricky. They're tricky in a couple, for a couple of reasons. Typically, you need to have um, your indices, your machine uh, has to be very well um, characterized. You really need to know the characterization of your coding machine for the materials that you're using. You really need to know what the index of your SiO2 is, your titanium oxide is, your um, tantalum oxide is, um, because you're going to want to choose these materials in, a, in an index ratio that's going to match properly in order to have this non-polarizing beam splitter work. And this is very, very finicky, uh, so you have to have your machine very well characterized for this. Okay, this one at random polarization at 45 degrees, you can see here we've got 50 degrees 
about 50% um, transmission and reflection across 450 to 600 in this example. Okay. If I calculate this in p-polarization, you can see I'm still getting a decent amount of transmission and reflection. Calculate this again, s-polarization, and the same thing. And so what we have here, depending on your specifications, the optical uh, device that you're designing these coatings for, you'll have a range of plus or minus um, transmission and reflection required for this non-polarizing beam splitter. And so in this case, we have random polarization, s-polarization, or sorry, p-polarization, and s-polarization. Uh, being reflected and transmitted very close to the 50% um, transmission and reflection range here. Okay? The design I'm using for this, I took from the paper, and you can see it's one medium, one high times two, one low, one high, one medium. Okay? And one of the things I want to point out here is although you don't need to have three materials or three indices to do a non-polarizing beam splitter, it does make it easier. Uh, adding that extra uh, index in there um, when you're designing, whether you're using just a single layer uh, in the center of a, a medium index, let's say, uh, in the center of a stack, um, it really helps out. And so you can see in this particular case, I'm using a substrate of SiO2. Uh, my medium index is aluminum oxide, and I'm using titanium oxide and uh, silicon dioxide. Okay? And this is at 45 degrees, of course, because it's a polarizing, a non-polarizing beam splitter. One of the things I want to show you is where I got this from, and a very good um, reference point to go from is... This paper here can be found at academicjournals.org slash J-E-E-E-R. And if you go to the search page and search for non-polarizing beam splitter, what will come up is this paper here, Non-Polarizing Beam Splitter and Anti-Reflection Coding Design. This was written... Uh, pardon me, accepted back in October of 2010 by these two gentlemen here, Haider Ahmed and Arafat Jalil uh, from the College of Science at Basra University in Basra, Iraq. And this is an excellent, excellent paper talking about beam splitters and beam splitter coatings and what's required, showing you um, circle diagrams, really goes into some very good uh, information and goes into some depth here, talking very specific um, refractive indices. You can see there. And these refractive indices, if you're trying these out, uh, just to try them out, or if you're actually looking to design a non-polarizing beam splitter, these refractive indices are very, very specific. So, you, again, you have to make sure that your coding machines are well characterized. And see here, it talks about changes with indices. This is an excellent paper. Um, the link is right here, and I'll make sure that's in the um, description of this video on YouTube. Very good paper. Here are the designs. You can see HL, ML, HL, and so on and so forth. Of course, they referenced what the uh, M, H, and L um, represent. The angle of incidence, the R, and so on and so forth, the delta R, delta A, and so on. Okay? Excellent paper. Um, you can find it at academicjournals.org. Okay? Now, talking about those particular um, designs, you can see that Beam splitters can be easy, but they can be tough. And so if you need rep ripple suppression or if you need um, uh, your polarizing beam splitter to work, a uh, non-polarizing beam splitter to work well, uh, with the indices that you have, uh, you have to optimize those. And as I said at the beginning, 
um, Practical Design of Optical Thin Films from Ron Willey has a section in there about, uh, he talks about optimization. Um, you can also find at the FTG software site uh, using Filmstars, which is what I use, I'll show you. We'll take a look here in the Filmstar manual. And he talks about and, uh, Fred Goldstein, who uh, produces and sells uh, Filmstar, wrote this manual. And you can see here the different optimization techniques to use and if and when you may need to use them. I have, uh, I've had a, a few people email me about optimization and what to use and uh, how to use them. And I've seen a lot of people um, just use damply squares all the time. You just put some numbers in there, bunch of layers, bunch of iterations, and click optimize and cross your fingers and hope for the best. Um, that isn't always the best way to do it. So if we, if you go to the FTG uh, software website and find the uh, manual for Filmstar, this will give you a description of the different. Um, methods, the different algorithms for running an optimization, Dampley squares, L-M or uh, Levenberg Marquand, numerical optimization library, and so on. And there's a, a short description here to get you started, um, giving you uh, what's required to start an optimization using these methods and which ones uh, work best in which circumstances. So definitely uh, find this and uh, read through it. It's a short read. I, I mean, you should have this manual anyway. But take a look at it, and it will give you a very good starting point um, on how to optimize, especially when we're talking about things like beam splitters, where they can start to get very complex. And the specifications required for transmission and reflection uh, in the optical device that you're designing these in films for can be very, very um, picky. And moving forward into actually producing these where um, your process or your production process um, has to be followed very, very uh, closely. Okay, so take a look at that. Um, helps out very, very much. If you have any questions, you can email me at Dave Taddeo at coderstech.com or um, go to the FTG website and there's a lot of resources there you can find uh, in technical issues and so on and so forth. Okay, thanks for watching. I hope that helps. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, if you need any help designing uh, processes, um, and now I'm starting to uh, get into used equipment sales as well. So if you're looking for spare parts, uh, coding chambers, I'm starting to reach out to partners uh, and uh, make those things available. Thanks for watching.